Okay, I know these notes look bad. I'm just going to keep going this way. <laughs> okay, so uh, morals and ethics. What did y'all find is the difference between morals and ethics? Morals is like what you think is right. Okay. What's required of you? Okay, good. So ethics is like, um, and that's a good way to put it, but ethics, it, it's like morals is what you believe about right and wrong, and ethics is kind of like your set of principles or like your set of standards, you know, according to what you believe is right and wrong, according to your morals. Okay. So it says, in every aspect of life, there are certain laws and legal responsibilities to protect you and society. So we've kind of got two sections or two different directions um, that laws can go. Uh, it says there's civil law and criminal law. Civil law focuses on legal relationships between people and people's rights. Okay, so um, like divorce court, for example, that would be done under civil law. Criminal law focuses on wrongs against a person, property, or society. Okay, it says torts occur when a person is harmed or injured because a healthcare provider does not meet the established or expected standard of care. And that word standard of care, that's one of the vocabulary terms on there, I think. Mm -hmm. and it's just what's expected. Like if I'm a nurse, which I am, so I'm not if I'm a nurse, I'm a nurse, and I'm if I'm working as a nurse, I'm expected you know, there's a certain standard that I'm expected to uphold, okay? Like, wash my hands before I touch anyone. You know, wash my hands when I go in and out of a, a room. Um, make sure I give medications correctly. You know, there's standards that I'm expected to follow because I'm a nurse. But look at these. Torts occur when a person is harmed or injured because a healthcare provider does not meet the established or expected standard of care. Malpractice. We know mal means bad. bad. Okay, so this is commonly called professional negligence. So, um, for example, a physician not administering a tetanus injection when a patient has a puncture wound. So, I'm working in the ER, somebody stepped on a nail, and they come to the emergency room. Tetanus, a tetanus shot. <coughs> a tetanus shot should be the first thing that's on my mind. Okay, dog bites, any kind of injury with any metal object or any kind of like foreign object injury, tetanus shot should be one of the first things that happens, okay? Or at least one of the first things you think of. Um, if they didn't, if that's an expected standard, okay? That's an expected treatment of that issue. So if they don't get that, that would be negligence, that would be malpractice. Okay? They're not practicing the way that they should. Negligence, failure to give care that is normally expected of a person in a particular position, like falls and injuries that occur, like if the side rails were left down. Or let's say um, somebody who is bedridden doesn't get turned, you know, every couple of hours like they're supposed to, and so they get a bed sore. Okay? That would be an example of negligence. Now, some people are going to get them anyways because their skin is so thin and they have, you know, don't have good circulation. But if someone, um, do y'all know what causes bed sores? We hear bed sores not only the medical term, we call them a decubitus ulcer. Um, sometimes we say DQ for short, but it's like a, a bed sore is just um, a skin ulcer, a pressure ulcer. Sometimes we hear it called a pressure ulcer, or you'll hear it called pressure sore or decubitus. And basically what happens is when somebody lays in bed for extended periods of time, they, you know, they're, the areas where they have, like, pressure, like elbows a lot of times, tailbone, um, hips, heels, anywhere, like, especially bony areas that are, have pressure on them just from laying in bed, you know, that skin, all those blood vessels are compressed. If they're not moving, you know, a lot of times their heart may go a little slower just because they're laying in bed so their circulation is not as good because again they're laying in bed they're not up and moving um, and in those areas in particular they can get kind of compressed well what does your blood carry oxygen. It carry oxygen right it carries oxygen to all of your cells all of your cells have to have oxygen to survive and so when circulation is hindered 
those particular areas don't get good oxygen. Well, if they don't get cells don't get oxygen, what are they going to do? They're going to die. Okay, those cells die. So it happens in a pressure sore, and um, and it they can happen in different ways. Sometimes they the skin breaks down first, and so it just develops like a sore. You know, just, and it can get deeper and deeper. There's four stages of them, and then there's an unstageable stage also. Um, so that's one thing. Sometimes they can actually get started on the inside. So the outside will just look like red or maybe kind of dark, but you can sometimes feel on the inside it's it's broken down, and um, and they eventually will open up and be. I mean, I've seen I have seen pressure sores that are just like gaping wounds. I'm talking huge and deep. I mean, I've seen muscle in the bottom of pressure sores before. So they can be really. Uh, I mean, they. I mean, I've had people I've changed dressings in, and I literally could stick a Q-tip like this far into there. Because they, sometimes they tunnel. Um, they like get little crevices where they won't heal, and they'll just like tunnel into their tissue. And I've had literally had Q-tips, I mean, stick them this far down in there. It still didn't reach the end. And they have to be packed. And then, Anyways, it's this big, you don't want them to get pressure. But that's just an example okay, of negligence. Is somebody not, not getting the treatment that is expected? Like, you know. Okay, um, assault and battery. Assault includes a threat or attempt to injure, and then battery includes the unlawful touching of another person without consent. Okay, now that's without informed consent. Now, if you'll notice, it says informed consent is permission granted uh, by a person who is of sound mind um, for a procedure. They also have to understand if they don't speak your language. They cannot give informed consent because they're not informed. If they can't understand you, they haven't been informed about what's going on in the procedure. So y'all probably seen something like this. It's always in the paperwork that you signed before a procedure or something. They'll say, you know, informed consent. And they have to go over with you what things can happen if, you know, if it goes wrong. Like what's, what are some alternative treatments? What else? What are other options and things that we can do? There's specific things that have to be included on that. <laughs> but battery is when you actually put your hands on somebody and do something that you're not supposed to do. Invasion of privacy includes unnecessarily exposing a person or revealing their personal information. So this is this includes confidentiality, okay, right? You don't want the whole world knowing all of your business that you have going on at the doctor's office. Um, but also, if you're laying in bed in the hospital, and somebody's giving you a bed bath and they forget a towel, okay, you don't want them to just leave you uncovered, leave the door wide open, and run outside and get a towel, okay, because everybody in the room is walking by the room, you know, and if you know how it is at the hospital, everybody looks in every single room that they walk by. I don't know why. I went to the hospital last night, it was like my mom's, my mom's brother, which is now. He's having an open heart surgery. And he's in the ICU, and I'm just walking by, and I'm just looking at room, and I'm like, oh my god, I don't know people are like, they're really about to. Well, I see you, those are really the sickest not. people, you know. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, everybody's like, everybody peers in every room, and it's like, your boss, the door's open. So, you know, if you don't want to leave somebody just laying there, sprawled out naked, <laughs> for the whole world to see, that's an invasion of privacy. Okay, nobody wants that. I don't care if they're awake or not. Even if they're unconscious, there's still no reason to leave them uncovered. Okay, just because they don't know doesn't mean they don't still have a right to their own dignity. You know? A false imprisonment refers to restraining a person or restricting their freedom. So like putting restraints on someone because for whatever reason. There's there's so much paperwork involved when you actually put restraints, like wrist restraints or a vest restraint on someone. Tons and tons of staff and paperwork involved. You don't want to do it unless you... Because well, you have to prove really that they need it. Yeah, you have to tell why they need it. Plus, you have to have somebody in different places probably have different policies, but you have to have somebody with them pretty much at all times, like one person assigned to that person because they have to do checks on them every so often and chart on them like every few minutes, whatever. So, okay, abuse has any care that results in physical harm, pain, or mental anguish. So, physical abuse verbal abuse, psychological abuse, or sexual abuse. Any of that can be included there. 
Uh, defamation occurs when false statements either cause a person to be ridiculed or damage a person's reputation. The two examples of these are slander or libel. And slander is when people speak it and defame someone. Okay, libel is when it's written. One thing I cannot tell you guys enough is to just be really, really careful with what you put on social media, whichever outlet you use. Um, one, you can get in big trouble for defaming someone or an organization. That's one thing. Two is colleges, uh, employers, technical schools, whoever, wherever you're trying to do, they can go. If you have something that is public, which pretty much every social media is public, regardless of whether you want it to be or not, people can access it. Um, they can use whatever information they get on there in their hiring process or in the application process. I read an article, um, that hasn't been too long ago, about this kid that had a full ride, like a basketball scholarship, to somewhere. Um, and when they went on his Facebook, they found something that didn't they didn't agree with. I don't know what it was. I don't know. I don't know if he was partying or if it was something else that happened. Or and maybe I kind of. Anyways, I don't know if it was a video or what, but they were like they they wouldn't give it to him. I mean, they took it away. Because um, they can use that. And so even right now, I know you think, oh, this college is like still a couple years down the road or whatever. I mean, it's not, you know, it's still there. It doesn't go away. And the same with any of that. Even Snapchat, I know you guys use Snapchat, but it's still there. It doesn't just disappear. Like it, somebody's got access to it somewhere along the way. And so anyways, I just, and I don't think I'm just being mean but I'm not like that's really and that's if I'm an employer that's where I'm gonna look that's the first place I'm gonna look because that's gonna tell exactly what's important to you it's gonna tell exactly what you do outside of work which which makes a big difference if I'm an employer you know let's say if I'm doing let's say let's say I have a nurse who let's say I'm in charge of a home health organization and I have a nurse who um you know has pictures on whatever and she's partying Okay, let's say that's on a Saturday night. Well, she gets up Sunday to go to work. Am I going to have a lot of confidence in her as my worker as if she's trying to do her job Sunday and give medicines or give IV medicine or whatever? No, I'm not because I don't know, you know, if she was passed out for five hours and not four, how is she going to get up and do her job or he or whoever it is? You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's they're going to look for that. So please be careful with what you put on there. Um, and the same goes for even just like everyday drama. You know, if you're one of those people who like list out 20,000 posts a day about whatever drama is going on, they're going to think, oh my gosh, this person's so whiny and so dramatic. I do not want that person working here. You know, just, just have some boundaries. You don't have to tell everybody what you ate for every meal. Um, okay, ethics. Our set of principles relating to what is morally right or wrong centers around respect for the needs and rights of other people <coughs> and provides guidelines for acceptable behavior. It's a goal to be achieved requiring constant effort. So typically, and you guys probably looked at this with your moral beliefs worksheet yesterday, kind of thought about what's important, family, culture, society, other relationships that you have that kind of help you form, you know, your own knowledge of what's right and wrong. Code of ethics related to healthcare delivery do not provide solutions, but serve as guides for contact, conduct. Professional associations have formalized code of ethics. Like there's a, a nursing board of ethics. I mean, there's a, a nurse nursing board, like the state board, puts out a code of ethics. So a certain way, standard of care, something that they expect from me as a nurse to have. Historical development, and this is what you guys actually tomorrow we're going to get a paper that's got the Nightingale Pledge and the Hippocratic Oath on it, and I'll let you guys answer some questions about those. Y'all can split into just a couple of like pairs or a couple of groups, I guess, in here. And then um, you're just going to kind of look at them and read them and see what you think about them. Uh, Hippocrates, y'all know him, Greek physician, um, 
to the 4th century BC, wrote one of the first codes, and you'll see the one that kind of stemmed out of that tomorrow. Mammonides is a Hebrew physician in Egypt. Uh, he wrote this prayer that incorporates ethical principles, the Nightingale Pledge. Where did that come from, Nightingale? Florence Nightingale. Uh, this one was actually, it says, formulated by a committee um, in Michigan, so she didn't necessarily come up with it, but, you know, she was the beginning of kind of nursing as we know it today. So, and then the Second General Assembly of the World Medical Association in 1948 has adopted the Declaration of Geneva. So it's another one that medical schools sometimes will go over. A code of ethics. Typically, within a code of ethics, you're going to find these things. Now, all of them are going to have like a semblance of these. They may not be worded exactly like this. One, the primary goal of the healthcare worker is to promote an optimal level of wellness, preserve life, and provide for a peaceful death when necessary. Okay? So, it's not, not everybody's job in healthcare is to make everybody well. Sometimes that's just not an option. But it is to allow and help people to live the best they can in the situation that they're in whatever that may be, okay, it, it may be to keep them alive, but it may be to help them, you know, deal with pain and have a good quality of life at the end of their life. Okay, number two, the healthcare worker respects the religious beliefs and cultural values of all clients. Doesn't mean that you have to agree with them, okay, but you do need to respect them, okay? <coughs> And it doesn't mean that you can't share your own with them. It's not what that's saying, it's just saying, you have respect for them and their beliefs, and you're not, you know, you're not going to push yourself in where you're not welcome. The healthcare worker provides adequate and continuous care for all clients, regardless of age, gender, race, or nature of the illness or injury. The hardest one in that is that nature of illness or injury. Okay, everything else, it's like, of course, we're going to treat everybody the same. There's nobody, you know, everybody's going to be treated the same. But that nature of illness, sometimes there's just some things that will get under your skin, and it makes it so hard. You know, like I think, like an example is, um, well, like in the emergency room, and I, I've never worked adult emergency room, but I know that they have people come in all the time who have OD, okay, and accidentally or whatever. So they come in, and you just think, you brought this on yourself. Like, why would you expect me to help you? You know what I mean? That kind of idea. Or somebody who comes in with liver disease and they say, yeah, I drink 15 beers a day for the last 20 years. Well, of course they have liver disease. Okay? They're an alcoholic. Um, and that's one of the things that happen. People who are alcoholics is they get liver disease. That's, and that's just the way it is. And so, you know, it's sometimes it, it's just hard to keep a professional, calm demeanor um, and treat people all the same when you know, when you know that they've done an injury to themselves, you know, they're a diabetic and they will not, they you see them eating gummy bears, you know, I and mean, obviously their blood sugar is going to be crazy. Sometimes it's hard to do that. The healthcare worker knows the limits of practice for which he or she is confident and stays within those limits and they know their scope of practice. I know what I can do. I know what I can't do. I can't write prescriptions. I'm a nurse. Okay. That's one thing I can't do. So... You know what you can and can't do. The healthcare worker practices jurisprudent behavior at all times by avoiding unethical or illegal practices. That just means that you do what's safest for the patient. Okay. The healthcare worker respects the dignity and rights of each client by maintaining confidentiality and a professional attitude regarding all their information. Okay, their information is private. You can't just share it with anybody. You can't even just share it with any other healthcare worker. Now, if they're directly involved in their care and they give them permission, then yes, you can. But I can't, if I work on the fifth floor, I can't go to the third floor and talk to that nurse about a patient of mine because it's none of their business, whether they work in the same place or not. They're not directly involved in their care. Now, if I'm giving report to the, you know, to the nurse in the operating room who's going to take the patient, that's different. <laughs> healthcare worker asks for clarification and assistance if they're unsure of any aspect of care. Hey, I shouldn't, if I don't know how to do something, I'm not going to go in and try it on a patient for the first time by myself. I'm not going to be like, hey, I've never put it in an IV before, but I'm going to try it out on you. That would not be good. 
And it's okay. It's okay to ask for help when you need it. You know, you would much rather ask for help and feel a little bit foolish asking for help than to do something and not know how and hurt somebody. Uh, the healthcare worker participates in professional activities, so you're involved in other things that, that teach you. You know, you have continuing um, education. Let me finish this last one, then you guys can go. Healthcare worker maintains a high standard of ethical and legal behavior, private life, and professional, just like we talked about with social media. Okay.